is maybe we could just go across the panel and talk about which part of the, of the film we just uh, saw um, impressed us and how it impressed us and, and just how the stories that were told by Bob Haley's great photography uh, um, reached us. And Alice, you've worked in, in uh, social justice and criminal justice reform in your years in Albany and reading stories tells you what's going on, but how important is it to have photography when you're, when you're trying to get a message across to the public? Well, I love photography <laughs> and always wanted to do it because I think it does tell you a lot about what's going on around... Oh, oh I don't have... Sorry. You got it. It's on. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here I am. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was saying I love photography and I try to be a photographer, but it doesn't quite work. But when I look at other people's photography, it tells me a whole lot about what's going on around them. And one of the things I liked about the film, I would like to point out uh, Mr. Clark, who's in the film. Yes. Uh, I was particularly interested in him because, as you can see, he's, I think he's in Lincoln Park. And so I was interested in what was around him, which was Lincoln Park, because it, te it reminds me of the problems that African Americans had in this uh, period of time that we're talking about, especially in the 60s and, of course, throughout the uh, history there. Uh, Lincoln Park is something that's identified as part of the black community right now. Uh, I go there when there's any kind of celebration because you can see black families coming there and uh, celebrating whatever event it happens to be. But I don't think people realize that uh, there's another side of Lincoln Park, and it tells a story about uh, this, this uh, city. That is, blacks were not welcomed in Lincoln Park in the 60s. They could not even swim in the Lincoln Pool. And when they were there, they, uh, when they allowed uh, some of them to come in, there was a separate part of the pool that they let them in. And they could not uh, have warm water when they got out to, um, to take a shower. So it, uh, and he also talks about Six Mile Waterworks and... Um, in the picnics. Uh, in the picnics. That's where African Americans went because they couldn't go to Lincoln Park. They had to swim in the Hudson River. Uh, Nebraska Brace, who was a leader in the community, tells that story in his book. Um, and he, was just, he, he talks about what that meant to him not to be able to take part in um, the activities of Lincoln Park and that they had to swim in the dirty waters of the Hudson River. Wow. Thank you. Uh, Richard Loverich, you're an artist and a visualist and a photographer in so many things. You gave some incredible insights into the photography of, 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 of Bob Paley in, during, the, uh, during the film. Can you just tell us a little bit about the difference between modern day photojournalism and the black and white world that Bob Paley uh, lived in and told his stories in? Yeah, let's, I'll try not to be nostalgic <laughs> in any way. <laughs> uh, when Mary and I first met to, uh, for her to decide if I would be in the film, um, she said, I'll bring some photos, and um, I'm sorry about that, um, and I'm not sure that I would have made the same decision again, but I said, please, I don't want to see the photographs. I want to wait until the camera's rolling. I'll take that risk, and I think that's reflective also of the kind of photography that your father did. You know, it is that an immense sacrifice that you see in every frame. And is there a difference between, um, I'll circle back in a minute, is there a difference between someone shooting, we hear it, right? You hear it at, a, at an event, the zip of the camera, where there isn't a Cartier-Bresson moment um, that, you're, that the photographer's waiting for, the bird watching, right? When I saw the pictures of the, uh, the horse auction. I said, you know, I'd love to speak to your father, because I'm sure for every picture that we look at and say, what a great shot, I'm sure Bob would have said, damn, if I was here, I couldn't be there. And that's where the shot was, you know. Um, 
So is it more, I mean, without the modern, like, hyper-zoom lens, when, when you see someone's toes in one of Bob's pictures, those toes are right there. They're where this water bottle was. And is that different? Yeah, that is different. And again, I'm not trying to put too much weight on uh, technology's past. And again, Bob himself, right? He wasn't there with a speed graphic taking one shot. Those guys were amazing. I worked with those people when I worked at Newsweek when I was young. I remember asking, I said, well, you didn't have a focus on the camera. So how did you know how to take pictures? You know, how to focus like that? And they said, what are you, stupid? I said, if you fall down, how tall are you? I said, I'm about six feet tall. If you fall down, that's six feet. <laughs> If you fell down again, that's 12. <laughs> Shut up. I was like, okay, that's, that makes no sense. <laughs> I have no idea what he's talking about. But, you know, Bob made a very modern choice, right? So he was modern for his time. I'm sure he'd be very up to the minute with technology. Would he be taking big bursts of frames? Would he be standing far back? Somehow I doubt it. You know, it, his work was that intimacy. When, and also when it, was, when it was mentioned that he didn't see, he didn't get to see the fruition of his work, I, I respectfully disagree. I think if, and uh, it's an impossible if, if things have gotten, had gotten so much better in our culture, he'd just be bored and he'd be finding, he'd be out there again finding the things that we need to know. And I think the, what he did each day, that was the satisfaction. You know, being there, when it was important. Uh, to see it later when, you know, if things got, I'm not so sure that would have been of much interest. He'd be out shooting something new. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think he would, he, he Bob got to see the results. And, and when, you, when you work in a newspaper and you publish a story, sometimes you see it right away. And certainly you know that, Joanne. Now you have a unique perspective here because you were a colleague. You worked alongside him and you knew him. Well, Bob was my colleague and Bob was also my friend. And um, those two things added together really helped to form me as a journalist and are something that I will always be thankful that I uh, knew Bob for a number of years, both before I joined the Knickerbocker News and when I worked there. And I think, you know, uh, a young reporter, uh, well, you sort of think you know it all, and of course you find out over the years that you, d you knew nothing at the beginning, and you're kind of embarrassed about it when you think about it. But Bob had a way of showing and teaching um, that words were not involved. You could just watch him, you could watch his approach at the scene, how he went about seeing the stories through the eyes of the photographer. And it would give you something to think about and something to try to incorporate into your own approach the next time you went out on a story. Well, Mary, you know, I was kind of jotting down notes as, as the film was, was going along and <laughs> JFK, Martin Luther King, RFK, the Brothers, the Civil Rights Movement in Albany, the Anti-War Movement in Albany, the Vigils at the Capitol, Resin Adams, Woodstock, Letchworth Village, exposing that injustice, uh, Dorothy Day, migrant farm workers in Columbia County, Attica, and then Danamora. I mean, which of these, how can, I wonder which you think were the most important of these stories that, that your dad presented to, to Albany. I don't think I... <laughs> I, um, I, don't, I don't think there is one specific story that's more important than the other. I think the arrow was remarkable. Uh, he photographed many um, civic actors uh, that I, uh, I know he loved and admired them. Uh, Peace Priest Jim Murphy, Regin Adams. I'm drawing a blank, but there are so many more. Uh, Peter Pryor and, and my parents were like sort of neighbors in Rensselaer in the 50s, Peter told me about belatedly, because he, he uh, you know, he, he owned a home there in Rensselaer. He wanted his children to n not attend Albany schools, but... Um, 
so dad had a perspective about a period of time. Uh, he, he, uh, he was a New Deal Democrat. He was a progressive Democrat. My parents were part of the Catholic Peace Movement. And uh, the era picked him up and carried him. And his photos caught fire. What, I made the film because he was just finding his voice at the age of 47. I mean, he, 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 was, he was just beginning to find his creative voice, and he got backdoored by cancer. He wasn't thinking about leaving a legacy. No, and, and Richard's completely right. He was a pure artist. He was interested in that moment, that moment of find, that decisive moment of finding the, the perfect image and capturing it. That's all he cared about. Then he wanted to get on to the next image. And my family members know that. My brother, my brothers are here, my sister is here. Uh, you know, he was obsessed with the camera. He was obsessed with um, expressing his visual ideas. So I can't identify a particular story. I know he captured great portraits of civic actors that he was... My parents loved and admired these people. I mean, it, he, they were very connected, okay? And I think that emerges in the photos. Uh, no specific story. It was just a terrific era for him. And uh, he didn't have time to um, think about leaving a legacy, so I wanted to make a space for him. Very nice. We have some tremendous panelists here, so we'd like to invite you in the audience to, to ask some questions. There's a microphone right over here. You can, you can walk up to it and you can ask a question of any of us. And, we'll, and there's another microphone right here. And, and we invite that and we'll continue the conversation with you participating. Hi, everybody. Hi, Mary. It's Barbara Smith. So wonderful to see you. I'm here. <laughs> I'm right here. I, I, I like need my sunglasses. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Having seen your wonderful first film, I had to come to this one, and it's just fantastic. Oh, thank um, you. He had a social consciousness, and there are many of his contemporary photographers and journalists who had no interest whatsoever in the kind of subject matter that he covered. So I think that's really important to understand and to know that not only was he a great uh, artist and practitioner of his art, he also had what's missing from so many. He had a social consciousness. And I first found out about him through your website, that beautiful website that you did, and which chronicled uh, black life in Albany and the civil rights movement and all of those matters. Um, yeah, and of course, that's a few years ago now, but this, this, was, this is really exciting. I hope that everybody in Albany gets to see it. Um, you didn't, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think you said anything about him working for the Time Life uh, publications. And if people are not aware of that, at the time, life was the ultimate of where a photographer's work, if it appeared there, you had really made it. So maybe you could say a few words about that. I can't. I don't know much about it. He wanted to earn a little extra money. So he was... He, oh. <laughs> I'm not sure I even need this. Yes, you do. I was a public school teacher for 21 years. And there are many of them in this room, and we knew how to project, okay? So I probably don't need this, but I will uh, use... Do I need it? Okay. So what was the question? Uh, no, I, no, I was just saying that I think... The time life contribution. Oh, I don't know much yeah. about... You know, you know how I found... My father did not, he was not self-interested, and he wasn't into braggadocio, you know? I didn't know any of these things, but when I, I did research, I read an obituary written by John McGuire. What, there was a, not a tribute, you know, at the time of his death, and I learned that he'd worked with McGuire, um, you know, he was a stringer for the Time Life Stable. That's, but as that's I all said, I, I mean, so he few never got to do that. <laughs> Pardon me? I can't, you know, I'm having a problem. I need the tin horn. 
<laughs> what are you saying? Oh, no, oh. I'm, I'm saying so few got to do that. Oh, the know. greatest photographers of the 20th century worked for life and for time. That's your father. Absolutely, Barbara. Thank you. <laughs> yes, absolutely, Herb. Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, can you all hear me? Uh, yes. You can hear me? <laughs> Question for Mary. Mary, because almost anyone with an iPhone can capture the moment today, right? And almost nothing can happen without it being recorded. What would your dad, do you believe, think of that? All these photo hogs running around. There's so many of them. We all take pictures of everything now. What would he make of it? <laughs> I think he, he was sort of a hippie by nature, so he would say, let a thousand flowers bloom, right? Um, but I also know that his photos are not snapshots. The best photos are filled with information. I mean, you've got to look at the background, the foreground, what's down in the corner. He was a full frame guy, and uh, you really have to look at the whole frame. And, 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 that, and snapshots on Facebook don't always offer that, right? Um, so I don't think he, he was never an elitist, uh, but he was, um, he composed, you know, and he took a long time and he observed and he'd wait and he'd stand back and eventually he, he'd find his moment, you know? Exactly. Did I answer? No, I think that the, the, the art of composition that you referenced, it, it's, it's lost with, you know, these quick snapshots that are taken today. You know, very, very excellent point. Yes. Hi, I'm Neil Dugan. Uh, one of those teachers uh, <laughs> that Mary worked with, uh, also worked with, I'm proud to say, with uh, Bill Clark. And what a great spirit he, he is. Uh, uh, I'm pretty amazed, and as I worked with you, Mary, you were an English teacher uh, and a good one. And now, all of a sudden, after you retired for some 10 years or whatever that is, uh, you're a, a filmmaker and a darn good one. And I, I would... As being a teacher, I take some pride in b b having been associated with you, and I, I, I encourage you to just keep educating people like you have. Thank you. Um, I need to say this emphatically. I am not a solo act. I don't work alone. Filmmaking is a collaborative medium. And many of you are not perhaps interested in, in the nuts and bolts of the medium, but uh, it's, like, it's like building an enormous hero sandwich, layer upon layer upon layer, and so many talented people get involved. It's, it's, uh, I, I'm not going to take credit for the beauty and elegance of this film, because I work with first-rate people. Okay, and, and one correction, uh, Pat Bulgaro, who's seated in the second row, is a, our screenwriter. One of two. I, I worked with him this time out, and I just wanted to connect with that. Mary Dugan, our producer and researcher, has been with me forever. She is a newspaper nut. She, <laughs> she loved going through those old broadsheets and researching and finding everything, you know? John and John Russell Kring and, and Tracy, who couldn't be here tonight, have taught me more about storytelling than I, I can convey. And Tracy Nicole Kring has beautiful eyes. What she did to burnish those photos, those photos didn't look like that. 15 years ago, this project started 15 years ago with four cardboard boxes, enormous boxes filled with photos. And we turned it into a story. 
And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of my team. I don't, you know, don't put it all on me. It's my team, okay? And one more thing, the civic actors in the film are truly remarkable. The people in the film are amazing. I mean, you know, it was a perfect storm. That era, the, the journalists and community activists, the youth movement, all those people getting together, um, they, they made a difference. It was an era of reform. It did crash in, in 68 and burn, but um, a lot of things were accomplished. So we have to be really praise those people as well. That's great, thank you. Mary, of all the stuff you left on the cutting room floor, is there anything you regret not putting in? If you had it to do again, what would you have added that is not in the documentary now? Oh, so many stories. <laughs> <laughs> Will it be a part two? You know, if I could have, if I had money and we could have made a three hour film, we would have told many of Peter Pryor's incendiary stories. His story that would, thank, thank you Paul Grundle for talking about Keeler's. Because Albany, we, we're, we love Albany and, and we're nostalgic and we want to remember Keeler's as a sort of classy, elegant place that served up great food. But, you know, Peter was d denied a drink there in 1954 at his grad law school graduation dinner. And he told that story. But I had no photos of Keeler's, so I couldn't share it. <laughs> um, he told a great story about uh, integrating Mid-City Swimming Pool. It took him two years, sick hearings. No photos, so I didn't, I didn't share that. There were many, many, many stories. Regent told a great story about trying to, going to uh, WRGB with some activists and, and attempting to take over the station. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, GE was, what? They had the second largest defense contact in, contract in the nation, right? And Regin was a piece. Right. And, and GE owned uh, Channel 6 back then, in those days. Right, so they went up there with yeah. the, a half-baked idea and they didn't execute it, but that was a great story and it was really funny. It was a funny story. There were a good, million of them. Would have been good to have on film. Well, t tonight, Tonight we saw in, in the film a kind of Albany in the 60s and how it changed in the 60s. And Alice Green, you, you were there in the 60s working for that change. Are we there yet? <laughs> you, you don't want me to answer that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but seeing the film, yep. I'm, I guess I'm the, only per I'm the only person here who did not know your father, even though he did take... Oh, you didn't. Oh, okay. Um, but I know I was in one of his photos, and um, it did uh, take me back to that period when we were still fighting for a lot of the same things we're fighting for now. Uh, particularly, um, uh, police brutality was a real issue uh, during the 60s, and uh, there's so many stories to tell about how uh, the democratic machine used the police department to control black people. Uh, it was very clear to all of us that we were um, to be contained in a certain area and uh, controlled by uh, police officers. The first thing I heard when I got to Albany was the name of um, an officer called Tony Dean <laughs> you probably know him. <laughs> oh, he, everybody, every black person in Albany knew Tony Dean. He was singled out as the enforcer. He was the one that was supposed to keep everybody in their place. And uh, he beat people, uh, especially black men on the street, and everybody knew that that would happen if they did anything. So there was uh, people who did not want to become involved in the change effort because of the way the police uh, control them. Uh, but the same issues that we are dealing with now, especially police brutality, segregation, Albany still is very segregated, uh, and we don't usually think about it in, that, in those terms, but um, people who, had, who were still migrating in the 60s to Albany, and 
There, um, there was very few places they could live. I remember working with a family uh, on South Pearl and Ashgrove in one of those apartments. And it was a one bedroom apartment and there were 19 people living there. And it was just unbelievable. So there are a lot of things that are pointed out in the film that I think we need to look at historically so we get a better sense of what was really going on in Albany. And uh, even though things have changed somewhat, those things are still there. And when you look at the South Mall, when um, all of those people were moved out, many of them, and I think there were like 1,700 of them were African Americans um, out of that total population, about 10,000. And once they moved them, um, a number of the blacks were moved into uh, some of the housing projects, as well as whites. But the other thing that people don't realize is that the housing project was segregated. And there was one of those buildings, I think it might be where my office is, I couldn't remember which one of them uh, was for white people. So, you know, that happened and um, it's still happening to a great extent, even though some things have changed. So yeah, um, um, there are many things that that film brought out that I think we could look at and see that things are still pretty much the same even though there have been changes. But segregation was definitely one of, and employment, discrimination, all of those issues are still with us. And we work very closely uh, with, tr with other people in the community trying to deal with the police issues which are still there as well. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nell Stokes, and I'm a community activist. I choose to be a community activist, probably because of Reds and Adams and a whole bunch of other people in this room. And I just want to say thank you for the film. It brought back so many memories, and I got to see so many people that I knew personally, and I know personally, like uh, Father Young and um, uh, Peter Pryor, who's my favorite person in the world um, because of his struggles uh, and the work that he did with uh, civil rights uh, when he was uh, in Albany as a lawyer. I'm just so proud of him and so many others, and I just want to thank Dr. Green for bringing up the point about uh, Lincoln Park and how um, black people were treated with that. And I'm just so grateful to be here. It's such an awesome presentation. It gives you so much food for thought and it allows you to keep fighting for justice. Thank you. Thank you. Could I tell, oh, <laughs> Reggie. Oh, well. You know, no, go ahead, oh, Alice. Yeah. Can I tell a story about Reggie? Where is she? Right, right here. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, I've done some work with Reggie before, and we've been on a number of demonstrations. We planned a really big, silent demonstration in one of the courthouses on death penalty issues, and it was, everybody joined us. It was silent. Reggie came in late, and she didn't realize it was silent. <laughs> <laughs> and she started arguing with all those people in the courthouse, and they blamed me. Reggie, you did that. <laughs> Next question. I, I live on, uh, on 175 South Swan Street, and it was built in 1965, and it's Michelama, and... Uh, it, it's adjacent to the memorial uh, park that they have there. Well, they wanted to build four buildings just like that one. But um, Dan O'Connell put a stop to it because it was supposed to be integrated with a lot of different races in there. And Dan O'Connell put the kibosh on it because he wanted it to be 
either all white or whatever nationality to be that, that entire building. So I thought that was kind of interesting that, that Alice should talk about uh, housing that was not uh, integrated. Very interesting, thank you. Um, before the next question, I, I, I wanted to, uh, to ask Joanne Krupe, if, um, who, who kind of reported that period, that, that last period of Erastus Corning as mayor and Dan O'Connell's uh, operation of the machine, and you were covering Albany politics for the Knickerbocker News during that time. Um, did, it, did it just end because their lives end and, 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 the, and better people came along with, with uh, with new ideas, or or was it was it that the community had changed and left them behind? I I, I wonder how, from your perspective, uh, that change happened. Well, I think it was probably a combination of both. I was thinking about this today, and I was thinking of Albany sort of being like a big puddle, and all these ripples um, coming out. So the brothers and the civil rights movement. Uh, when I came to Albany, I came to cover the first school board election. Hard to believe. School boards are elected lots of places, but in Albany, it was a seismic event. Um, I covered the development of neighborhood associations. Uh, every place has neighborhood associations, but again, in Albany, where there was no established political opposition, the neighborhood associations were viewed very suspiciously because uh, people were asking for things and not asking through the traditional system of their uh, ward leader. Uh, they were going directly to City Hall and saying, hey, you know, what about the condition of the buildings? Uh, what about the parking situation? So I think, you know, for a machine where uh, control was everything, because without control, you couldn't keep your power. All these small changes sort of chipping, chipping, chipping away. Um, and then you had the deaths first, first of O'Connell and then of Corning. So pulling all that together, I think that you got the change that I think is still underway today. Still underway, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, my colleague and I, we just um, are in expressive arts, and um, we were just in the audience and thinking about this. Um, I really commend the project and the, what you're doing here, and today's film was amazing. Um, I'm just wondering how we could keep that rolling. You're on a roll, you know, the neighborhood that disappeared, this one. I mean, the Lincoln Park story has got to be told. That's another film that has to happen. Um, but the, what I'm wondering is, we're, we're at an event where there's all these people, we see each other all the time, same people, all coming out to these things. Wouldn't it be great to have some filming of the folks who come out to hear the stories of the people who are here? We really need support, folks. There's a lot of stuff we're all fighting, right? So we need to start hearing the stories of people who are struggling today to push things forward. And I'm just throwing that out as an idea as to how we could think about doing that, maybe after an event, having a film camera, expand this a little bit to really connect the two, to connect the lineage of what Mr. Paley did and your family did. So just a thought. Thank you very much for all this great work. Thank you. I'm sorry. Could, could I Hi, just there. mention about oh, um, yes. Olivia Rory, because she's in, yeah, in your film as well. Talks about uh, great affection. Right. I don't think people understand the role that Trinity Institution played in changing Albany. It was incredible. Um, that's where uh, somebody knows Trinity. Uh, the Trinity got a grant, a federal grant, to do community organizing. And uh, I take the credit for Olivia Rory, even though it's not mentioned, um, but we were organizing some of these neighborhood groups, and Olivia Rory um, was an interesting person. She's sitting on her doorstep, and I'm walking down. We're looking for people who might be leaders, and uh, Jack Mayer, who was a community organizer, you also mentioned, and I think uh, uh, Bill Kennedy talked a lot about him, but um, 
we were looking for someone who had a really big mouth, <laughs> who, could, who was not afraid to talk, because we're, we're still in an era when there was just so much control. People in the community didn't know if they could say anything. Uh, they were afraid they would lose their housing, their jobs, and all of those things were going on. And so we were going to have a big meeting to try to uh, organize a group, a neighborhood association. And uh, so Jack Mayer and I were walking around the South End, and we came upon this woman that I had met earlier, and we stopped and talked to her. And I said, Jack, I think you uh, should think about this person, because she would be perfect. And we had the meeting, she came, and nothing was ever the same after that. Because <laughs> she, <laughs> she would tell Mayor, Mayor uh, Erastus Corning, uh, O'Connell, all of them, to go to hell. And she did it very well. <laughs> so she's the one that really got people in the community organized to the point that they could speak out and they could really take some action. And some of those demonstrations in front of um, the city hall were photographed by your dad. And so I really appreciate it. Did anybody, anybody read her sign at the Wallace protest? <laughs> Classic Nagoop. Classic 1968. Vote for Rosemary's baby. Yeah. Right, that <laughs> He's a bitch. <laughs> I would want to say, um, I was told some people feel like they're getting a little restless, so we've got the last two questions. If you could ask them quickly. Afterwards, we have a reception right next door in the lever room. We can continue the conversation, as somebody mentioned. And copies of the DVD are for sale. I'm sure you could get Mary to sign one. And uh, pick up a copy of the film. But last two questions. Sure. Great. Thank you. My name is Vicki Smith, and I'm a member of the Albany City School Board. And uh, I wanted to, uh, and also I dabble in amateur photography and have been uh, uh, on a documentary or two, uh, pr primarily around land loss um, of black farmers in the South. Um, uh, other, another story that keeps needs to keep being out there. Um, I. Um, First of all, thank you very much for the film. Um, I was not a, am not a native of Albany, but I have lived here uh, most of my adult life and raised my uh, family here. Uh, the film for me uh, uh, reminded me of how much I'm still um, in, not in the know of Albany, you know, um, some of the history and some of the impacts. And, I, and Dr. Green, I want to thank you so much for identifying some of those those stories uh, in terms of uh, expressing the black experience primarily um, and it also it, I think um, the stories uh, about that are that come emerge from your father's photographs also remind me a great deal of the south where I come from and as much as I thought I was leaving some of that I'm still kind of in some of that um, and I find uh, also in Albany what's frustrating is uh, as much as things change in some places, they don't change in some places, um, fully or wholly. And I, f and I feel that particularly in education. Um, the Corning years, I f think, feel like they were devastating, educational-wise, to our community, to, in fact, the entire community. And with the effects of that, we still are having to deal with and address. So, sorry for the commentary, <laughs> um, but my, I also wanted to ask you um, about your perhaps plans or um, intentions to work with our students uh, in the school as you have done in your past, but really in the area of expressing their voice, of using their um, artistic um, ex um, you know, creativity to, to tell the story of their life experiences. Um, so that was my only question, but just really thank you all, the panel, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our last question. <laughs> With the, um, the financial pressures and staff cuts that newspapers are facing, um, photojournalism in particular has taken a big hit. Um, what are ways that newspapers can still keep doing this important work of holding a mirror up to the community? Or is it something where that, that time has just passed? 
was that one for? <laughs> I'll let y'all fight over that one. Okay. Well, let me, let me uh, as a, a current editor at the Times Union, I can tell you that the size of the photo staff has done nothing but shrink in the last, uh, last uh, maybe several years, in the last 10 years. And it, and it has not been made up by people with iPhones. Um, photojournalism is an essential part of the newspaper, and I think tonight we saw that, and we saw why, and it's, and we, we need the community to tell their newspapers how important photojournalism is, and I think tonight is testimony to that, and I think that this, this film should be seen by every editor at the Times Union because it underscores that as we, as we try to navigate very rough waters trying to uh, continue to succeed and to thrive as, as a newspaper in a time when newspapers are facing uh, great difficulties. We, um, I can say that we as a community are fortunate to have a company and a commitment like Hearst does to the Times Union. There's a lot of communities that don't have that and we're fortunate for it. It doesn't mean that it's perfect and it doesn't mean that more shouldn't be done, but um, it's a struggle, and balancing that is, is without question a challenge. Um, and I'll kind of turn it over to Paul here as we... Uh, I want to thank our <laughs> panel moderator, Mike Spain, panelists Alice Green, Richard Loveridge, Joanne Krupe, Mary Paley, and especially the crew and the filmmakers of More Than Words. Powerful, beautiful work. <laughs>